Greetings all, Ferrari Man 601 here. Welcome back to iRacing and welcome to Le Mans, where we're going to take a quick look here at this. The BMW M8 GTE absolutely gigantic, enormous, bigly meme generator. Yes, this car and the memes that it inspired definitely were the best things to come out of Le Mans 2018. And finally, we have it here in iRacing. It is a very interesting addition to the iRacing lineup, pretty much because, well, I don't think we were really expecting it. At very least, I wasn't really expecting to see this car in iRacing anytime soon. But here it is, and pretty much in keeping with how current iRacing does endeavor to be, at least when it comes to cars from major series. For example, last year, we got the Dallara IR18 mere days after it broke cover for the first time, and hey, we had it in iRacing, and here it is now, this, the BMW M8 GTE. It's been racing for about a year, but at the same time, it's still a pretty new car, and we do have it here in iRacing. I don't know entirely everything about this car, and this is not intended to be a full-on review of it. I just want to do a couple of laps here around Le Mans and explain to you why I like it so much. I've really taken a liking pretty quickly to this car. And uh, it's kind of taken me by surprise. I don't normally feature GT cars on the channel, even though I did get my start in sim racing many, many moons ago, driving tin tops like these, so I do like them. But over the years, open wheelers have sort of taken precedent over anything else. But I do like to come back to these kinds of cars from time to time and just take a look at what they can do. And, well, this one can definitely do quite a bit bit. Here we are in the cockpit, and we've got our typical iRacing HUD up here on the screen, but we take a look around in here. Very nice detailing from the iRacing development team, as you might expect. And of course, these guys, I'm led to believe, do have real-world access to the real-world car so that they can do interior and exterior scans with their laser scanning technology to get all the shapes right in terms of the proportions of the steering wheel and the seat and all the little hoses and little ancillary lines going into the cockpit. Obviously, you've got the netting around the driver's seat just to keep him contained in the event of things going very pear-shaped. And you've got all of the screens in here as well, which will come on when we flip on the ignition, as we have just done. Center, that is your rear view mirror, as it were. It's actually a camera that's sitting on the rear bumper there. No mirror, obviously, inside the car. And that center screen, that is your main dashboard. That's showing you all of the information that you could ever want to know about what's going on with this car. Again, I don't know all that much about it, and I'm still learning it as I have just been driving it a little bit here and there. But it's a really nice one. Let's take it out on track. We fire it up. The engine sputters into life. 1,253 RPM seems to be our happy idle, at least in map 1. Bring it down through the engine maps, down into map 12. That is the safety car map. The idle speed drops right down to 703. Pretty low, but you've got obviously different intermediate steps in between for your engine map. Down here through map 11, these are different maps that you could do uh, during the race, either to save fuel or for different torque curves and things, whatever you need for a particular situation, but map 1 is full power all the time. We've got a 6-speed sequential box in this car, paddle actuated as you might expect, given the size and shape of the steering wheel there, but very, very cool, and also you'll find that this car is extremely responsive to driver input. It feels almost like an open wheeler in many regards. Yes, of course, it's a lot heavier and obviously it's got a roof, but driving dynamics are pretty cool. Drop it into first gear, punch up the pit lane speed limiter. You have about five laps of fuel left. Feather the clutch in iRacing's new stall dynamics. Just get some heat in the brakes and tires here as we go through the first sector here at the full Le Mans circuit. Of course, this car and many others like it will be visiting France for the 24 hours of Le Mans come June. Coming down onto Mulsanne for the first time. He's getting everything up to speed now. 
Car feels really stable at high speeds, pushed about 170 miles an hour now. Clean as you like, coming down toward the first chicane. Break a bit early and pick up our apices as we should. Back on the throttle. Car does have traction control, of course. All of these things would be used over the course of a longer race because, well, you've got multiple people driving the same car, doing multiple stints in many cases. And, of course, you're running for a very long time, particularly at places like Daytona or Le Mans, where you're running for 24 hours straight. You might want a little bit of, ele of electronic nattery here just to help you keep things in line at 2 o'clock in the morning. Water temperature coming up to 194 there. Tires are coming in, brakes are coming in real nicely. We're ready to show it some proper cornering speed, I do reckon. And a first gear here for the hairpin. On the power, hitting the rev limiter there. Engine revs up to about 6,800 RPM. And it sounds quite nice. And I still think the sound of the car is very important. Uh, it doesn't matter how well it handles, doesn't matter how good it looks, it has to sound right, particularly if you're going to be spending a lot of time in the seat. So, yes, sounds good, gets approval in my book. Gearbox is very responsive, shifts are very quick. The auto blip on the downshifts works a treat, no problems there. No stabbing at the gas by yourself. There's a spark cut on the upshifts as you would expect on a semi-auto box like this. Into the Porsche curbs. Very nice, 130 miles an hour through here, lifting a bit, some understeer setting in. Again, I really, just like all of you, haven't done much running in this car yet, haven't done any setup work at all, really. So still learning how it works. Could probably dial out some of that mid-corner understeer at high speed with some setup tweaks. But for the most part, it's pretty responsive. Of course, you have to respect its limits. It's not an open wheeler, so it does have some more weight to shuffle around. And of course, it's only got so much tire. But, within its limits, it's really sprightly. I like it. It is, of course, turbocharged, as you would expect. Turbo lag is pretty well non-existent, I've got to say. The car does have a pretty effective anti-lag system that kicks in when you come off the throttle, so when the engine is on overrun as you're coming down through the box, the anti-lag comes in, so when you get back onto the power, it's just instant and it's at 100% right away. There's no lag, there's no waiting for the engine to catch up with the throttle pedal, it's all there. At high speed, you know, just got my hands off the steering wheel right now. It's pretty stable. No buffeting. The suspension works very nicely, even at high speeds, to absorb some of the bigger bumps. I can imagine it would get a little bit hairy on bumpier circuits or perhaps in aerodynamic turbulence following another car, but pretty rock steady. Hundred, two hundred, one fifty. Jump on the blinders. Try second gear. Car does have traction control. We're running the default traction control settings for the moment. 
unless you really get into it really hard at very low speed, you're not going to get much in the way of wheel spin. Medium speed corners getting on the power too early, yes, you can sort of coax the back end out into a four-wheel drift sort of situation, but very easy to recover. Really no nasty surprises going on here. Get up to the rev limiter here in a moment. Some high speed turning for you. Third gear through there. You can get on the power pretty early, especially there because the camber of the road helps you out a lot, but still it's pretty stable. Definitely a very much enjoying this one. And again, I really wasn't anticipating to like it as much as I do. It's just really, really reassuring. And uh, that's exactly what you would want from a car that's designed to be driven flat out for 24 hours. But really, it's, uh, it's a champ. It absolutely is. Made a little bit of mess of the final chicane there, but not god awful, I suppose. Yeah, not quite flat there for the first corner. Under the legendary Dunlop Bridge. Flat through here. Third gear, get on the power. Nice, car always gets a little bit light there over that little crest. Very cool. I have to say, I really like the, the start of the lap here at Le Mans. A lot of people love the Porsche curves and whatever. And yes, they're very exciting and really challenging in the right kind of car, but the start of the lap here. It's really dynamic. You're never going straight. It's fantastic. You don't get a, a chance to really to take a breath until you get down to Milsan. It's a great challenge. And of course at night, when there's not much lighting going on, has a completely different element of intrigue. Coming down this uh, second part of Mulsanne between the two chicanes, I always kind of wonder a little bit, when do I get back over to the other side of the road? I tend to do it quite early, but I guess there are different philosophies behind it. Not that it really matters all that much. Of course, traffic in front of you is going to dictate that more than anything else. A little bit of a slide starting to set in there. Just back out of the power a little. Even with TC, it's, again, it's not going to be solving all your problems, so you do have to be mindful. And of course, as your fuel load burns down and your tires start to wear, got to be even more mindful. Almost went too deep into there. Lost a little bit of time, but we got away with it. Also on the dash here, you can see some more instrumentation going on. When I'm under braking, you see a whole bunch of multicolored lights start to light up on either side of the primary display, as well as on the uh, rear view display there. That's letting you know when you're getting close to locking up the front axle. So again, a little bit more of a visual help there because quite obviously you can't see your front tires. There you go, you saw it come up there. A little bit on both sides, a little bit more on the left.
Also on the dash, the primary display, you got tire pressure there in the upper left. That is in pounds per square inch. Below that, you've got your fuel level in gallons. Below that, you've got your lap time delta. So we're up 1.66 on this lap. And your last lap time is displayed in that bottom left box. Everything else on there is pretty self-explanatory. Ah, a little bit of a tank slapper wanting to set in. We don't get a 1x. Gonna get a 1x this time though. They say you can't yeah. Score. You'll have to slow down and give up the time game. Yeah, I cut the course, I know. Yeah, still the best lap of the session. Barely. Stop, 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 yes. <laughs> How did we not take out those ball arts? I don't know. I'm angry now. I didn't want to miss the chicane there. So we're going to go for it. There we go. Gain three quarters of a second. Come on, meme machine. What have you got? Three hundred, two hundred, one fifty, one twenty. Not the tidiest way through there, but it worked. I also really like, in terms of the gearbox dynamics on this car, yes, it's very quick shifting and, you know, just flicking paddles around, but I like the uh, driveline elasticity that you get in there. When you upshift, you get a little bit of a wobble from the engine RPM. Really cool. This is where Mark Weber likes to depart the earth. And breaks. Little lock up there on the right front. Didn't seem to be too bad. Got a little bit of vibration on the front end, but hardly anything at all. Rev limiter. Second gear, power on. Yeah, I got the tail out a little. Second gear, pick up the apex now on the power. Beautiful. to Porsche. He's playing with the throttle all the way through. Oh, come on. Wall contact. I'll invoke the Andretti rule. If the car comes back with all the lettering still on the tires, you're not trying hard enough. Brakes. Third gear, on the power. Second gear, one, two, power. There we go. And that's how you gain 3.3 seconds a lap.
but it does go to show you when you want to push it, it will be there for you. And it'll be consistent corner to corner, and you can get the back end out a little bit if you really want to. And you'll be able to recover it just the same. That's a drift, and that's going to be some wall contact. Yeah. So uh, what was that about being able to recover it? Well, you know, there are limits, of course, but all in all, not too bad. Of course, this is the other problem with uh, a circuit as long as this. If you do have a little bit of an incident and you have it at the wrong time, it's a long way back to the pits. But, you know, we kind of kiss the left rear a little bit. The car's still going straight. Still feels fine over the curbs. absolutely great. I don't know why I like it so much, but I like it so much. Again, it's, it's a it's a big car, and I mean, yes, uh, uh, it's been it's been memeified, of course, but the, the memes are rooted in reality. When you look at this next to, I don't know, the Ford GT or something like that, it is noticeably larger. I'm not entirely sure why BMW decided to make this car so big. But, uh, you know, it, it's a, it's a big-ish car, and it's a heavy-ish car, but at the same time, it feels very nimble. It's the perfect marriage of the chassis dynamics working in harmony with the electronic systems, working in harmony with the engine. It's just, all in all, a really pleasant thing to spend some time with. And uh, I look forward to racing this car as we uh, move forward in the year and uh, get, a, get an idea of which series this car is going to race in, and uh, yeah, definitely I'm going to be looking forward to doing that. Take to the pit lane. The pit in here is absolutely ridiculous. And there's the limiter line. Here the fuel cut and the backfire going on with the exhaust coming out either side of the car. It's great. It's an absolutely fantastic little thing, or big thing, to get your head around and to pound around uh, some laps in. It's, uh, it's again, it is faster than you think, but still completely manageable. It is still very much a GT car, but it, it, the, the relative size and relative weight of it, it's a little bit misleading because it does feel really agile. It really does. It doesn't feel like a big car. It doesn't feel like a heavy car, even though, relatively speaking, in race car terms, it is a big car and it is a heavy car. But honestly, I really, really like it. 
take a look at uh, the replay here. Perhaps we can get a decent angle of it from outside, or maybe not. Eh, there we go. Not a bad angle. Can we see the damage that we did to it? That's a little bit of a better question. How, how badly did I scuff it up? Might be able to see from here. Uh, doesn't look that bad at all, honestly. And that, that was not uh, an in... What's the word I'm looking for? That was not an insignificant impact. So, yeah, I guess it is a little bit of... Huh. Nice. I'm, I'm really kind of dumbfounded. I thought there'd be more damage than that, but really, there isn't. That is good to see. It's Of course, we're getting a whole bunch of tree now. Come on. There we go. Huh. Nice. Very, very nice. I, uh, I like that a lot. Was... Huh. Everything symmetrical? I don't know. Did they uh, not implement a damage model on this yet? Because there should be some damage on that quarter panel. Tr truly. But nope. Not even here on the, uh, the other side where we scuffed the wall. Everything just looks as it should. Real nice. Real, real nice. I like it an awful lot. And hopefully, you all like this an awful lot, too, because, yep, that is pretty much all she wrote, at least in terms of my first reactions to the BMW M8 GTE. It is a really awesome-looking car, first of all. I mean, just look at that thing. I mean, it's the BMW design language very clearly, but it looks good. BMW don't change things very often for a reason. It's what they're known for, and, well, it just works. Even the liveries, the default livery here, the only thing I've changed there is the car number to run my typical iRacing 47, but yeah, that's it. BMW M8 GTE. It's enormous, and it's enormously great. So, again, you're going to be seeing a lot of this car on this channel as we move forward into the spring and summer months because I do want to be racing this thing in anger, and uh, I don't know. I feel like perhaps we could be on for something good with this one because it just meshes so well with everything that I like, and I'm going to continue to test it and learn more about it and figure out what makes it tick, but really... It's a great, great, great addition to iRacing, and unexpected, at least uh, on my end, but I'm very happy that they have added it. I leave you with a look at a couple of hot laps here at Le Mans with the M8 GTE, so you can get a better sense of what it sounds like both internally and externally without me blabbing all the time all over it. So stay tuned for the hot laps, everyone. FerrariMan601 saying thank you very much for watching, and of course, we will see you soon.
Thank <laughs> you.